Hello everyone, this is Bob Lowe, CSIA Executive Director. Thank you for attending the October CSIA webinar. Today we are continuing our webinar series that was designed in conjunction with Nick Setchell. And Nick opened the series in August, Ken Edmondson was last month, and now Nick again. And next month on November 20th will be Jeff Miller's presentation on project management. All of these webinars lead us into the 2014 conference. Details on all webinars are available on Connected Community. In today's webinar, Nick will provide information on 24-month rolling plans and forecasts. Be sure to ask questions in the Q&A box. Uh, Nick enjoys interaction, so don't be shy. Uh, the webinar will be archived for later viewing, and the slides will also be made available. The host and sponsor of our monthly webinars is Software Toolbox, a CSIA partner member. Software Toolbox helps system integrators lower their risks on projects that involve software by providing them a unique mix of off-the-shelf software products and rapid response technical support that minimizes the need for custom code and lowers field startup time risk. Now let me introduce uh, Nick Setchell for those of you who are not familiar with Nick. Uh, Nick is CEO of Practice Strategies, a business improvement consulting firm that defined and developed real-time CEO and fiscal focus. Nick has analyzed in excess of 1,000 businesses and worked with hundreds of CEOs and executives around the world to help them better understand their business performance and make better business decisions. And that also includes some CSIA members. Nick is also a top-rated international Vistage speaker. So without further delay, here's Nick. Thank you very much, Bob. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. For those of our attendants in the United States, good morning. For those of you in Europe, good afternoon. And welcome to the third of our seven webinars, um, Proactive Leadership in a Rapidly Changing Landscape. How appropriate that title is since we had our first webinar two months ago in August. I think you probably all agree that uh, both on the domestic United States front and on the world front. The landscape is changing so very rapidly. And these webinars, I hope, are preparing you and helping you to run your business in, in that environment. Remembering that as business owners, you have two fundamental responsibilities, to create value and to mitigate risk. Let's just position where this webinar sits in the series again, and specifically, let us, let us look at the seven webinars that are in the series. In August, we kicked off with the holistic overview of proactive management. That gave you a high-level perspective on what leaders of business need to be thinking about. Then in September, Ken Edmondson shared with us some of his expert insights into organizational culture. Today we're going to be talking about one of the key elements of risk mitigation in your role as a business leader in, uh, in as far as using 24-month rolling as a mechanism to not just predict the future, but take more control over the future. And then the remainder of the series, as Bob mentioned, leading through to the San Diego conference next year, will be Jeff Miller, Ken Edmondson, Gina Khalil, and then myself uh, leading into the San Diego conference. Those of you who attended the very first webinar in August would have heard me talk about the fact that as a leader of a business, you can identify your responsibilities into quadrants. The foundation quadrant, the market quadrant, the people quadrant, and the operations quadrant. We also talked in that first holistic webinar about the core management responsibilities of 3W accountability, of measuring your business in a way that was easy for your key executives to understand, in a manner of validating decisions with something other than gut feel, um, we use a mechanism uh, called should we, can we uh, decision validation. Those of you who attended the conference last year in Florida saw a significant amount of that process. J-curve management is a topic that we're going to be talking about in webinar seven of this, of this series, where you're spending money today on something that will benefit your business in the future. 
there's a likelihood that uh, the spending will involve taking a step back today in order to take two steps forward tomorrow. Um, you all ha heard Alan at last year's conference talk about the fact that this year is a, a year ripe with opportunity to make investment in the future. J-Curve Management is going to provide you with a framework to hold that strategic and innovative um, investment accountable. And then today we're talking about one of the fundamental tools of risk management, that being real-time planning. So that's where this module sits into our, our full webinar series. So let us open up with a quote, a quote from one of the world's great historians, Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill said, he who fails to plan is planning to fail. Now, of course, Churchill was referring to armies and nations, but believe me, it is every bit as relevant for those people running businesses. Now, what I have witnessed, having had the opportunity to work with a number of CEOs around the world, is that the role of planning or the role of forecasting typically is assumed to be a numerical role and therefore is delegated to an accountant. Now, please do not believe that I am being tough on accountants as I talk through this topic. I myself, a long time ago in my career, qualified as an accountant. I didn't remain in that environment very long. For the vast majority of my career, I've been running businesses, not measuring them. Having said that, some of the things, some of the numerical foundation that I learned as an accountant early on in my, in my life was very, very useful. But I have observed that too many accountants today believe that planning or forecasting is really about taking confusing numbers, pushing those confusing numbers into the future and then graphing them. So allow me to share with you a cartoon that I found recently. And I'll just give you a couple of seconds to read this cartoon. Believe me, if you take meaningless data and you graph it, all you'll end up with is a picture of meaningless data, which will not necessarily tell you where your business is at or indeed help you to plan. If you want to look at a mountain range through a tennis racket, go and go to a ski resort, pick up a tennis racket and look at it, but do not refer to that as planning. What we're going to be talking about today is a mechanism to help you plan the future, to forecast the future, that is very, very different from traditional budgeting. Monica, can I just call on your assistance for a second? That's okay, I think we've come back. My screen disappeared for a second. That's all right, I think we are back. Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk then about where real-time planning came from, where 24-month rolling came from. It is fair to say that when we first designed this module, we did so in the understanding that most businesses were struggling with the traditional budgeting or forecasting process. In dealing with a number of businesses and in helping them to interpret their financial performance, we were keen for businesses to share not only historical information that told us where the business had come from and told the business owner where they'd come from, but we were keen to be able to talk about future data from the business. So we would say to the business owner, um, rather than just talking historically, can we talk about future data as well? And time after time after time, the business leader would say, the problem is, Nick, that we don't have a crystal ball. We find forecasting challenging. Things change so quickly that any forecast that we could give you would be out of date by the time we'd sent it to you. So there's very little point you seeing our traditional forecast data. And it got us to thinking about why was traditional budgeting so flawed? And we'll talk a little bit about why that was the case. And, and really it got us to, to doing a, a significant amount of research into the area of, of, of looking into the future and, and taking control of your risk profile of your business. I want you to imagine when we designed 24-month rolling that we rolled out a blank canvas and very much took the view 
What if there were no rules to the way a business forecast? And particularly, what if we weren't restricted to some of the mechanisms that you had been used in the past? How could we design a process that did more for the business's culture than just to forecast what was going to happen in the future? And in essence, what we were aiming to achieve as we designed this module was four things. The first, and in many respects, the most important element of this process was to formalize effective strategic conversations at the management level of the business. Now, most of you are probably having these type of conversations in an ad hoc fashion reasonably frequently, but by formalizing the process and bringing in each of the key thought leaders in the business to participate in that conversation, that was going to be a central theme to having a better understanding of where the business was going. The second thing that we wanted to try and achieve with this module was to create a really powerful real-time management reporting. We had dealt with numerous businesses who had said that one of their key challenges was receiving data in a timely fashion that helped them run their business and had observed that the traditional accounting output, which was often reasonably slow to get to their desk and in a format that they didn't understand, wasn't really helping them run their business. So we wanted this mechanism to produce real-time management reporting. The next thing that we wanted to do was to have more accountability and control over the sales management of the business. Now, it's very, very interesting to talk to different businesses and talk about the sales role within that business. In my experience, quite often in a professional services environment, like systems integration, uh, most of the individuals have come from a highly technical background, see themselves as technical experts in their, their field, the field that they've probably received most of their training in, but do not necessarily see them as seasoned sales professionals um, and, and therefore, that side can create quite, quite significant challenges to the business. It was very evident to me that for businesses that didn't have a formalized um, way of assessing where their revenue streams were going in the future, that this planning mechanism had to cover the area of sales management. And finally, and by no means the least important, but almost as a side impact of doing the first three well, we wanted these systems to produce really accurate forecasting of the most important thing that you need to track in your business, which is cash flow. Those of you who heard me speak in, in Florida at St. Petersburg at the conference would have, would have heard me say that most people when they're running business tend to be a little focused or obsessed on information they read on their profit and loss statement. Typically, they don't pay as much attention to their balance sheet because it's a confusing document. Both of those documents produce important information, and when you draw the most important elements of both of those documents together, it enables you to understand the health of your cash flow, the single most important thing that you need to be tracking in your business. So we wanted really accurate month-by-month -month cash flow forecasting to fall out of the bottom of this process uh, just as a, a given. Once we were doing the first three things effectively, we wanted to ensure that cash flow forecasting was accurate. Now, you can all be the judge as to whether or not the process that we designed met those four strategic requirements within the next 45 minutes. But what I can tell you is that this module that we've now implemented into businesses all over the world, um, typically the business starts off with the mindset we're introducing a forecasting module here, and as they get more and more into it, what they recognize is that this has the ability to completely change the culture of their management style and the effectiveness of their management style. So please, as you go through this webinar, keep an open mind. We are not just talking about turning um, you into better forecasters and creating better budgets. What we're actually talking about is creating a more efficient management culture. So part of the process, as with all of the uh, modules that we design, 
was to do extensive research, first of all, on why the traditional mechanisms did not work, and secondly, on how an alternative could be more effective. So in talking to hundreds of businesses about traditional budgeting, we learnt a number of things. We learnt that typically budgeting is done once a year. Most businesses still have this mindset that they have a year start date and a year end date. In the United States, typically the year starts on the 1st of January, it finishes on the 31st of December, you then reset the clock to zero, roll over and start again. And as you approach the end of your year, you start to think about what the budget for the following year should look like. I would be surprised if there was anybody on this webinar who genuinely believe that their business closes down at one minute to midnight on the 31st of December and opens up again one minute past midnight on the 1st of January. The reality is, I'm sure you all understand, is business is a dynamic thing that moves through time and therefore we have to find ways to measure and predict it based on that dynamic flow. The next thing that we learned about traditional budgeting was it was typically focused on the income statement. So very few businesses budget their balance sheet. Now I understand why that's the case because so very few businesses genuinely understand their balance sheet. But the reality is that a, a budget or forecast focused purely on the income statement is miss, missing a significant part of the information that the business needs to understand. The next common theme was that budgets and forecasts were typically the domain of the CFO. I'll talk a little bit about why that can be a flaw shortly, but that was typically what we were told had been the case in the past. And interestingly, the last piece of information that we were given was that in reality, budgeting was a frustrating process that really was of very little value. The reality was that as quickly as you could set your budget in stone, the landscape had changed and that budget was no longer relevant to the reality around your business. So with that understanding as to why traditional budgeting was flawed, we went about creating a new process and we did that by asking all sorts of questions. And here is a question that I would like you all to ask yourself as, as you listen to this webinar. This question ruffled a number of feathers as we asked it around the world. Who in your business, who in your business is best placed, is best qualified to predict and influence the future? We asked that question hundreds and hundreds of times. The most common answer to that question that we got was the business owner or the CEO. The person whose role it was to be looking at the horizon and leading the business into new horizons. And I for one believe that that to be the correct answer. Those of you who saw my first presentation on holistic business management heard me talk about how the, the leader, how the CEO, how the business owner has to be spending some part of every day looking into the future and determining where their business is going. The second most common answer we heard to that question were the sales staff, the people talking to customers about what the customers wanted tomorrow. The third most common answer were the operational staff, the people going in the day after the salespeople and delivering on all of the promises that the salespeople had made the day before. Those were the three most common answers owner slash CEO, second salesperson, third operations people. How many times do you think we heard the answer to the question, who in your business is best placed to predict and influence the future? How many times do you think we heard the answer, CFO or accountant? I'll give you a clue. It was a round number. Never did we hear that the accountant was best placed to predict and influence the future. Most of your accountant's training, if not all, has been focused on measuring the past. Very little has been focused on influencing the future. So our follow-up question was, why then do you make your accountant or your CFO the custodian of your budget? Right from the outset, you are setting up the process to fail. Believe me, that got people's attention particularly the CFOs who are a little bit peeved by this stage. 
The next question, the absolute core of this entire webinar series is how often is the landscape ahead of your business changing? If there's anybody in this webinar today that believes that the landscape only changes once a year, then first of all, you are in a blissful state of ignorance. But secondly, you're probably not going to benefit from this webinar. Nobody believes that their landscape changes once a year. If indeed it did change once a year, once a year budgeting would be fine. But the reality is it's changing every month, every week, every day, sometimes every hour. And therefore our tools need to reflect that. And then a couple of logistical questions that I'd like you to think about. Is there a better way for us to measure the past and is there a better way for us to plan and forecast the future? Now these are logistical questions. I'd like to knock these off reasonably quickly and then I'd like to bring the conversation back up to a more strategic level commensurate with, with leading businesses. So let's first of all answer the logistical question. How, what is the more effective way of measuring the past? And let me tell you that there are fundamentally two ways to measure the past in your business. The first is what we call year to date. The second is what we call 12 month trailing. I genuinely hope that a number of the participants in today's webinar have already heard of and have embraced 12 month trailing. This mechanism has been around for many years and any of you that have embraced it will have seen, as all others have seen, that this is a very powerful tool. It's a no-brainer. But having said that, we still observe that the most common format of measuring business is the year-to-date mechanism. The mechanism that is driven by your accounting system, the mechanism that is driven by most governments around the world who need a start date and an end date, and if your start date is January, your end date is December, any stage between those two dates, your accounting system should be able to produce what's called a year-to-date income statement. It might be nine months to September or 10 months to October or something like that. While that is the most common way of measuring business, believe me, it is the least effective. And the reason it's the least effective is that at only one point in the year, being the end of December, are you actually measuring the full 12-month period. For 11 twelfths of the year, you are measuring a part year. And if your business is seasonal, and most businesses have some seasonal ramifications, then for 11 twelfths of the year, you are getting an incomplete picture. For that reason, 12-month trailing is a very powerful way of overcoming intra-year seasonality. 12-month trailing takes the attitude that every single month end is the end of a 12-month period. It doesn't matter whether it aligns with the external financial year or fiscal year. This is a mechanism for you to use within your business to manage your business. Every single month can be seen as the end of a 12-month period. So if we were looking at 12 months to the end of September 2013, of course the period would be August, sorry, October 12 to September 13. And in essence, this removes the impact of intra-year seasonality to enable us to focus on the things that are genuinely changing their business over the long term of the business, not just the fact that one month's busy or one month's quiet. So let's have a look at these two components uh, diagrammatically, and I hope that you'll get a very clear perspective of why this mechanism is a no-brainer. This has been around for a number of years, and if you've not adopted it, I would strongly recommend you all trial it. So first of all, let's have a look at the year-to-date approach diagrammatically. Now, don't worry too much about the dates that we're quoting here. They're just examples. But a year-to-date business would, would, would measure your business typically for 12 months to December 2011, then 12 months to December 2012. At the end of each year, you reset the clock to zero and you start measuring the business through the year. Now, here's the problem. If your business is seasonal, it will produce roller coaster trends. It is very, very hard to understand and measure your business using roller coaster trends. You will spend half of your life cracking open the beers and celebrating. You'll spend the other half of your life diving for the razor blades to slit your wrists. 
It is not a particularly effective way of running your business. It's stressful, it will lead to a series of knee-jerk reactions. So, 12-month trailing as an alternative is going to be more effective. So let's say that we measured the business for 12 months to December 12. At the end of last year, the law stated that you had to, let's assume that you did that. And you are now at the end of January 13. There is no internal rule that tells you that you have to reset your clock. You could, in fact, simply add January 13 to your December data set and drop off January 12. And here's the mathematical reality of this transition. If the month that you've added on is stronger than the month that you've dropped off, then the trend is going to go up. As simple as that. If the month you've added on is weaker than the equivalent month last year, the trend is going to go down. As simple as that. This is an instant indicator as to whether the strategies that you're implementing into your business are stronger, making you stronger or weaker. You don't have to wait to the end of the year to measure yourself. You get this endorsement every single month. This is a no-brainer. Most of you, I hope, have already adopted 12-month trailing. And those that have, have already identified how powerful it can be. But that is only half as far as I want you to go. And I would now like you to consider the next element to this process, which is the alternative way of forecasting the future. Let us first of all talk about the traditional mechanism of forecasting the future, which is the traditional once a year measurement I described at the beginning of the session. And this forecasting mechanism is typically accompanying year to date measurement. So let's say that we had got to the end of September 13, which is pretty well where we're at in this fiscal year, and let's say that your accounting system had enabled you to produce um, year-to-date information for the first nine months of the year. And let's say that your accountant was reasonably proactive and said, you know what, to that nine months of actual data, I'm going to add the remaining three months of the budget because I'd like to get some sort of insight to what the business is going to look like at the end of the 12-month period. That mechanism is the mechanism used by most businesses to predict what they're going to look like at the end of the year. Most businesses use that mechanism around the world. Let me tell you that there is absolutely no logic to that at all. And let me try and prove to you that there's no logic to that, using a motoring analogy. I would like you to imagine that you've just bought a brand new sports car and you're humming along one of those magnificent freeways that you've got in the United States, uh, whatever the speed limit appears to be. I, from what I can gather, I think it's about 85 miles an hour. If you drive any slower than that, you seem to get pushed off to the side. But anyway, you're humming along at whatever the speed limit is. Now, research tells us when we're driving a car, at that sort of speed that you are aware of at least a field of vision in front of the car of at least 120 yards. And what happens in that field of vision in front of the car um, helps you to make decisions on driving your car. And I'd like you to visualize that your car's flying along the freeway and your field of vision, the 120 yards in front of the car, is moving along the freeway with it. it it's instinctive, it's natural, it's what we do. Let me tell you what you don't do, or more accurately, what I hope you don't do, is to allow or start off with 120 yards of field of vision, and then somewhat vaguely allow that field of vision to shrink back towards the car to a point where you're driving at high speed, looking 10 yards in front of the windshield. That would be absolute suicide, and I'm quite sure you'd all agree with me. And if you do agree with me, I'm left with one very basic remaining question. If that would be so foolish in your motor vehicle, why are you doing that in your car, in your, in your business? Do you understand what I'm getting at here? As this period of time moves through the year, the distance that we are looking forward is shrinking. At the end of October, we then look forward two months to the end of December and so on, until such time as we start to prepare next year's budget and our field of vision bounces out another 12 months. There is no logic to this process. 
So let me share with you a process that there is logic to. We call it 24-month rolling forecasts. 24-month rolling forecasts presuppose, pre-assume, that you have already implemented 12-month trailing. So at the end of September 2013, you should know what your business has achieved for the previous 12 months. You should know what it looks like from October 12 through to September 13. What we would then like you to do is have a perspective of what's going to happen to your business out for the next 12 months, for the next 120 yards in front of your car. Not just out to a fixed point of time defined by the government, but 120 yards in front of your car. So in essence, the 24-month period is two 12-month periods rolling through, through time. Now, what happens when we progress by a month? What happens when we finish October 13? Well, the first reality is that our 12-month trailing is going to be updated. October 13 is now an actual month. October 12 drops out of that time frame. And then I would like you to reassess your perspective of the next 12 months. Now, at about this stage, somebody in the webinar is sitting there thinking, oh no, I've just worked out what this, this, this chap from Australia wants me to do. I imagine you've all picked up by this stage that I'm Australian because I have a slightly different accent. But somebody in this webinar is now sitting there going, I think this mad Aussie wants me to budget every single month. Is he nuts? And let's be honest about the budgeting season, guys. We love the budgeting season, don't we? We love it. Accountants buzz around our business, thrilling us with their sense of humour, collecting up information that we're going to lock down in stone, and within, what, 30, 40, 50 days of the new year, that information's out of date. But don't worry, we're going to overcome that fundamental flaw by setting aside a significant amount of time the following year to do what is called budget actual variance. You all know what it is because you all do it. Sitting around a table talking about why the actual result differed from the budget that you designed seven months ago. What an absolute waste of time. You all know it's a waste of time because you've all got frustrated by it. Those of you who have not adopted 24-month rolling, please take a leap of faith. This process is not only more powerful than what you're doing now, it's actually easier. So let us now turn our attention, having gone through the logistics of trailing measurement and rolling measurement, can we now please turn our attention to the mechanics of the process? Now, I told you earlier on that one of the most common mistakes that businesses make is they put their accountant in charge of forecasting. Now, believe me, we've spoken to hundreds and hundreds of businesses, and we say to them, hang on a second, if that person is not the most qualified person to predict and influence the future, you've just told me that they weren't, why do you put them in charge of predicting and influencing the future? And the business owner or the CEO looks a bit blank, and typically we get two answers back. Well, we do that, Nick, because forecasting is about numbers, and they're our numbers guy. If I don't get them to do this, what do I get them to do? Well, that's the most common answer I get. The second answer, which is the one that completely blows me away, is, do you know what? He's the best with Excel, so we got him to build it. Now, that one's just completely unbelievable that you'd hear that, but we do. Let's come back to the first answer. Forecasting is about numbers. He's our numbers guy, so we get him to do the forecast. Can I tell you that the number one mistake, the number one mistake that is made when businesses embark upon a forecasting mechanism is they go to numbers too quickly. Most of the people on the webinar today who have tried forecasting in the past or will try and implement some of the things that we talk about today will fall into the trap of going to numbers too quickly and it will compromise the value you get out of this process. Allow me to share with you why that is the case. When we were designing this entire module, we did all sorts of research and some of the research, believe it or not, was research into how the human brain operates. Now that gets pretty pretty existential and pretty interesting and some of the stuff we read 
was logical, some of it was pretty hard to believe. But I'll share a couple of examples with you, you can make your own mind up. But let me tell you that some of the stuff that was very easy to believe was this. When the human brain is processing objective fact, numbers are objective, aren't they? There's a right and there's a wrong. When the human brain is processing objective fact, something that engineers and system integrators do well, what the human brain will do is narrow right down and focus on the issue and try and get it right. Because frankly, it's embarrassing to get it wrong. When you ask a human brain to process subjective fact, where there's no right or wrong, the human brain will naturally open right up and consider all options. Because it's not threatened with the embarrassment of getting it wrong. So why is this relevant to your situation? Why is this relevant to the conversation we're having here? It is relevant because it is absolutely likely, it's almost certain, that somewhere out there in left or right field of your business is an incredibly exciting opportunity or quite frankly a dangerous risk. And if you narrow your vision too quickly, you will miss it. The opportunity will sail past like a, a ship in the sea. Uh, more dangerous than that, the risk might broadside you, might punch you in the side of the head without you even seeing it. Remember the responsibility of the business owner and the CEO. Create value, mitigate risk. If you're too narrow in your vision, which typically numerical people will be, you will not be a good forecaster. Now, what I am about to say will offend most of the people on this webinar. Women are better at this than men. Can you believe that I would have said that as an Aussie? Can you believe I would have said that? Women are better at this than men. Guys, I'm sorry, it's a fact. Men are hard-coded to be solutions guys. Some of you may even have experienced this when you go home to your wife at night and you say to your wife, how was your day, honey? Because somebody once told you that was a good question to ask. How was your day, honey, you ask? And your wife says, well, thank you for asking. I had a terrible day, an absolutely terrible day. Not a problem, you say, jumping up onto your white horse. I'm a solutions guy. Tell me what happened. I'll fix it for you. Hey, guys, I hate to let you into a secret, but your wife doesn't want a solution. They just want to chat. And what I heard and, and was taught quite recently is apparently they'd like you to listen. Jumping to the solution is a fundamental flaw in forecasting. It will compromise the process. So what we've done is to design a series of questions that enable you to drive this conversation and should be done each month at a strategic level first, then at an operational level, then and only then do you drop down to the numerical level. But do not drop down to the numerical level until you've covered the strategic and the operational effectively. So here are the questions that I'd like you to, to build into your monthly management agenda to underpin both good business management but also good forecasting and strategic management. The first question I believe to be one of the most powerful that you should ask in your business. What information has come to light in the last 30 days that changes our view of the future? Every single person on this webinar has learned something about their business in the last 30 days that changes their view of the future. Whether that's an issue in your local environment or whether that's a macro issue, every single one of you has learned something about your business in the last 30 days that changes your view of the future. Now, I'm going to give you some examples of some of the things that our clients talk about to answer this question. There are no rules to what you can talk about in this question other than you are not allowed to talk numbers. Here are some of the things that some of our clients will talk about, but quite frankly, the best conversations, the business will define their own business-specific bullet points. But certainly a conversation about your proposed marketing strategy is extremely valuable. And I know CSIA has been doing some work with you on helping you with marketing strategies. Are you opening up any new markets? Are there any new competitors in your marketplace? Or sometimes after recessionary times, there might be less competitors. 
are you launching any new products or services? Or within your product and service <coughs> offering, has there been a mix change? If you're a project-based company, and so many of you are project-based companies, have any projects come forward or slipped back? Those of you who are project-based companies know the projects never come forward, they only ever slip back. And my fa personal favourite in terms of how the landscape's changing so very rapidly is what is happening to your supply chain. Not just availability, but reliability and price as well. And have a look at some of the macroeconomic events that have occurred around the world in the last two years. The last two years alone, that's had uh, half a dozen or so once in a century events. Tsunamis in northern Japan impacting componentry, electronic componentry. Unrest in the Middle East impacting uh, availability of oil. Um, floods in Australia impacting availability of coal. And if you think you're not influenced by these things, look again. Every time you turn on a light globe, you're influenced by these things. So what is happening in your supply chain? Fundamentally, one of the things I'm hearing across the United States is that businesses are growing quickly after a very tough global financial crisis. Therefore, they're looking for more resources. Everybody's looking for the same resources. So how are you going identifying those resources when everybody else is after them as well? I don't mind what bullet points you use to answer this question. Just don't answer it numerically. Let your mind remain open while you're discussing how your landscape has changed strategically and operationally. Question number two, how will your behaviour change to accommodate what you've just discussed? And think about that change of behaviour in, in, in two components. How will, you, how, how will you turn an opportunity into value and how will you mitigate a risk? Most of your behaviour as a business leader should either be about capturing opportunity or mitigating risk. And then the third question is what will be the numerical implication of these changes? Now, that question is very, very important and it's there for two reasons. Firstly, you have to bring this conversation down to a numbers base eventually, otherwise you're not going to be able to analyse it. Believe me, most of the tools that we design to put into business have a numerical basis. While they have a numerical basis, they're there to drive conversations. But at the end of the day, you need to bring it back to numbers. But the other reason why question three is there is if anyone hears anybody talking about numbers in questions one or two, you say, no, stop. I don't want to talk about numbers yet. I don't want to close my mind down too early. I want to explore these issues before we, we tunnel vision our mind. Now, once you've had that conversation, you're then going to go into some sort of a model that you will have set up and update that model. So first up, and, and Excel is a perfectly good tool to build, build this model. First up, you'll have your descriptors in, in column A, um, revenues, direct costs, indirect costs, you'll have some balance sheet items as well. Whatever the month you've just completed, and don't, don't get too hung up on what month that is at the moment, but whatever month you've just completed, you're going to replace what was in that month that was previously a forecast with what actually happened. What was the final result? Plug that in, because that is the final result. It's not going to change now. Now, currently that model should have 11 months going into the future, not just out to the end of your current fiscal year, but what was 12 months into advance a month ago. And the first thing that I'd like you to do is add on another month to the end so that you keep this model 120 yards ahead of your car. You then drive the conversation that we've just talked about, and when you get to the third question, which is the numerical update, you come down into this model, and you change any number in this model that you need to change so that this model reflects operational reality, so that it reflects the landscape that is ahead of your business. Not in a conservative way or an optimistic way, but it is the best assessment of the reality ahead of your business. We well, get Nick, I have, all... Nick, I, have, Nick yeah. I have a question for you. Go on, Robert. Could you, give, could you give some examples of... You, did, you gave one or two some examples of what those items might be? Sure. Let's say that we're sitting the 10th of April, we've got our March final figures, 
and we're having our chat and during that conversation somebody says, hey guys, that big project that we were going to be starting in June, I just got a call from the CEO, he's had to go overseas for a couple of weeks, um, he'd like that project to now start on the 1st of July, not the 15th of June. Uh, there's nothing wrong here, it's still going ahead, but he's very keen to be in the country when we kick it off and he can't start it on the 15th of June, we're going to start it on the, on the 1st of July. So all of the revenues and costs that were going to accrue for that project in June now need to re be removed and put into July. We're going to reduce what we thought was going to happen in June and we're going to increase what we think will happen in July because we now have information that we didn't have 30 days ago that is a new reality. Does that make sense, Bob? Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Another example, we might say, do you know what? The demand for our services has grown faster than we expected. We need three extra people. In our forecast, we didn't know we were going to have to have these people, but do you know what? Starting in October 2013, I've got three extra people on salaries of $120,000 per year or whatever we happen to be paying them. Um, we now need to change our perspective of the future to reflect this new decision. We, we could never have known this back at the beginning of the year when we did our once-year budget, but we do know today because we're using information of today. Another example. Very now, good. this type of thinking, this type of rolling thinking immediately creates some resistance. Let me share with you a couple of, of areas of resistance. The first is people look out a year in advance. So you've just finished March and now I'm asking you to think about next March and they think, oh, next March is so far away. How could I possibly think that? What if I get it wrong? Well. The second most common mistake that businesses make when they're forecasting is fear of being wrong. Let me take the pressure off you all guys and absolutely promise you that your forecast into the future is going to be wrong. I'm sorry if that shocks you but it's a fact, it's going to be wrong. Nobody attending this webinar has perfect view of the future. Do you know how, do you know how I can say that with confidence even if I've not met you? If you had perfect view of the future, you wouldn't be attending this webinar. You'd be down at the casino putting 10 million bucks on the eight red that's coming up in 17 seconds. Now what I'm about to say is one of the harder things for people to comprehend. This has never ever been about is your forecast right or wrong. Your forecast is wrong. What this is about is making your forecast as close to right as possible given all of the information you have at your disposal and then managing your risk profile accordingly. If reality turns out to be 2% higher or 3% lower than what we think it's going to be, what is our risk profile? That's what this is about. It's not, be, not, not about being perfect, it's about being as good as you can be in managing your risk profile. Now, the, the other thing here is, just think for a second, when people tell me in, at the end of March this year that next March is hard to predict, the very best time for you to have your first crack at March, the very best time is when you've just completed March, when all of the seasonal variations of that month are fresh in your mind. Do I expect you to get it right? Of course not. In fact, we've just admitted it's going to be wrong, but here's the good news, guys. You're going to have 11 opportunities to fine-tune and tweak that column of numbers prior to it becoming an actual number. So as it gets closer and closer to the current date, it's going to get more accurate. The other way of looking at that is that you're probably better equipped to assess what revenue you're going to do in November 2013 than what revenue you're going to do in November 2014. I get that. And the, the other extension of that is that we're going to spend more time talking and thinking about the next three months than we are data that's 12 months out. And the reason for that is born out of the second piece of information that we, we found out when we were researching the human brain. Guys, this is the piece that completely blew me away. This was the thing I really thought, oh seriously, how do they know that? But I'll share it with you and you can process it your own way. Did you know that the human brain 
processes data in packages of 90 days. Did you know that the human brain processes data in packages of 90 days? I didn't. In fact, my initial reaction to that was, oh, come on, psychologists, how can they possibly tell us that? that that's just ridiculous. But then I started to think about it. And there's no shortage of examples in the world to prove that that's the case. Um, if anyone on this webinar has, has worked in the television industry, you will know that the television industry has a hard and fast rule of the number of episodes in a drama series that they will never exceed, which is 13, 90 days, because our brains can't hold the plot any longer. Universities and colleges, when they're designing curriculum, and there's going to be some teaching time and some vacation time, teaching, vacation, teaching, vacation. Each term is how long? 13 weeks, 90 days. There are all sorts of examples around us that demonstrate that 90 days is this, this manageable amount of data that we can process. So we use a process, or we've coined a phrase called 30-90 vision. What have you learned in the last 30 days that impacts the next 90? If your staff are telling you they can't tell you what's going to happen in a year, so be it. But they should be able to tell you what's going to happen in the next 90 days. Guys, let's keep moving. And I want to, I've, we've got about seven or eight minutes left. And I'd like to leave a couple of minutes, Bob, at the end for questions, if that's, if that's possible. But I'd like to touch on the concept of how this process can also be helpful in terms of sales management. And I want to talk about this whole concept of understanding your future revenue streams. And one of the most common questions that we get asked when we're setting up forecasts is the question of, should I be forecasting as an aspiration model or as a reality model? The difference is aspiration is what you'd like to achieve. Reality is what you know you've got locked away with projects that are reasonably certain. And for some reason, people feel as though they've got to do one or the other. Our process doesn't force you to ch uh, change, uh, uh, choose. Our process says do both and understand that the gap between your aspiration and what you know you've got locked away is really your sales risk profile. So we try and define revenue in terms of levels of certainty. And uh, our descriptors are fairly obvious and you'll recognize them very quickly. Marriage, engagement, dating. Marriage revenue, you can name the source and you're fairly confident you're going to receive that revenue. Engagement, you can name the source, but they haven't yet chosen you. You've still got some work to do to win that work. Dating, highest level of uncertainty. You can't even name where it's coming from. That telephone call hasn't even come in yet. It serves a very important purpose in your business to understand that future revenues have different certainty levels. If I can just show you an extract of, uh, of the model that we use here, where you'll have an aspirational total up here for future months of a certain amount per month, and then it serves a very useful process to break that down to revenue you know you've got locked away, which is marriage revenue, and you can list that by revenue classes, that's okay. And then revenue you're still hoping to get by the same revenue classes with a percentage a weighted mechanism here. So this is what salespeople have traditionally referred to as pipeline management. It's a very sensible thing to do to understand where your future revenues are coming from. So what, if engagement revenue is what you can name and you're hoping to get, what is dating revenue? Well, very simply, dating revenue is the gap. Let's have a look at these November numbers. If in November this business wanted to do $1.4 million of revenue, it's got locked away 1.1 million, 1.18 million. It's got a further 310 that it's pretty sure is going to fall, and furthermore, it thinks it's going to get 50% of that. So of that 310, it's pretty confident it's going to get 155. Then 1.18 plus 155 is 1.33. The difference between that and our, our hoped or aspirational total 1.4 is $98,000. $98,000 is the gap they've still got to find. That's the phone call that still has to be made, the opportunity that hasn't been discovered. And logically, you do not want too much dating revenue exposure in the immediate months, particularly if your sales cycle is beyond 30 days. And many of your sales cycles, guys, are well beyond 30 days. It serves a very useful process to break your future revenues into what you are certain of, 
what you are hopeful of and what you've not yet found. That drives a very effective sales conversation. So when I talked about the four criteria that we had in 24 month rolling, the first was to create better management conversations. I hope you will agree that by going through those three questions each month that you'll achieve that. I hope you'll agree that by stratifying future revenues into certainty levels and revenue classes, you will have better sales management and accountability. The next level, oh sorry, just to extend that by the way, the, the value of having revenue certainty levels is when you bring this information back into a 12 month trailing basis, 12 months that goes back into the past and out into the future. If you put a different color on these three levels of certainty, you get an instant graphical indication of how exposed or how high your sales risk profile is in the future. The more red and the more yellow you have in the future months, the bigger your risk. And you need to do one of two things. You need to either reduce your aspirational total, which is not my preference, or you need to fire up your marketing and your sales activities, which of course have been the subject to previous conversations in this webinar series. Guys, the next thing that we talked about was the necessity to have clean, simple management reporting. We have found that where we implement this style of management reporting, which is based on 12 months just completed, 12 months um, going into the future, and a, a process that draws together our more important income statement items of revenue, direct cost, and indirect cost, with our more important balance sheet items of collecting money, managing inventory, and managing payables, to give us a cash flow perspective, that where we've implemented that style of management reporting that tells you where you've come from for the last 12 months and where you're going for the next 12 months, the level of numeric literacy of it, financial literacy in the business grows instantly. Instantly you've got an indication of profitability, a cash flow of the business, profitability of the business, and the critically important salary multiple, the number that tells us for each dollar of wages we're paying how many dollars of revenue are we creating. So that's the real-time reporting that falls out of this process naturally. Other real-time reporting that becomes critical is you have to understand, and once you've got an accurate calculation of cash flow, not only how that cash flow has, has mapped in the past, but where you think it's going into the future. And at what point is it possible that it may dip into negative territory, something that I hope it doesn't do for your business, but it might, and if it does, do something about it before it happens, and particularly do something about it before your cash reserves run out. To be forearmed with that information means that you can plan and go and have conversation with your funders before you need it, not during or after. Guys, very quickly, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we're coming up to the end of the hour and I know that your time is, is precious and we said that this would be an hour. Here are some of the things that we have been told as resistance to 24 month rolling. Can I tell you that every, sing every single time we have put 24 month rolling into a business, we've had resistance. This is a very different way of looking at the future of business. It's a change, and people don't like change, particularly if it's your numerical person doing the forecasting in the past. They are going to hate this concept. Can I also tell you that every single time we've put 24-month rolling into a business, the resistance we got, which will fall under one of these categories, has evaporated within the year. Each and every one of those areas of resistance is rubbish. It will evaporate within a year. Sometimes it takes a business that long to understand that, or sometimes it takes some people in the business a year to understand it. Let me tell you, a proactive business owner or leader will understand this instantly. Guys, I started off with a quote from Churchill. Please allow me to finish with a quote, one of my own quotes. The really great thing about the absence of planning, the really great thing about the absence of planning is that almost certain failure will not be preceded with unnecessary stress. You fail to plan, you're almost certain to fail. The good news is it won't be too painful just before it happens. Now, jokes aside, 
planning is critical. Planning is critical on any landscape, but the more rapid that the change is on your landscape, the more critical planning is. And that is why this webinar has been the third in the series of proactive leadership in a rapidly changing landscape. Guys, I'm going to make sure that these notes that we have, uh, these slides that we've used today are made available to Robert in a PDF form so he can make them available to you. Robert, can I thank you and the CSIA organization for hosting this series? Monica, Monica can I thank you and Software Toolbox for producing and, and managing the platform, as always, superb. And ladies and gentlemen who've attended today, thank you for attending. I hope you found this useful. I hope you come back and join us for our next webinar next month. Thank you. Nick, I have a question. If we could uh, do a fast rewind to uh, how we how will we change behavior at the end of a 30-day period. You mentioned opportunity uh, to execution, and you mentioned risk management. What would be an example or two of risk management? Um, just if I could take a shot at it, would it be like, well, if we get all those projects, we won't have enough people, or if we don't get some projects, we're going to have too many people. Therefore, how do are, are these risks? Are these good examples of risks? Or can you they're, think about they're fantastic. Risks? They're fantastic examples of risk. Let me give, uh, look, you, you've absolutely nailed one of them. So many people as I, I travel across the United States are telling me that the next six months, the next year are going to be a time of opportunity. Alan told us that at the conference. It's, it's coming true, as most of what Alan says is. And people say to me, Nick, we've got five bids out there. We're going to win three. It's fantastic. And I say, well, it is fantastic. Tell me, how are you going to resource all this extra demand? Oh, that'll be a nice problem to have. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. That's a high-risk strategy. Those of you who got caught out by the tsunamis in Japan and you you, you struggled to get electronic componentry that you needed, um, that presented major risks. I had a client in America, the day the tsunami passed through the US, got onto the one supplier, the one domestic supplier of the componentry he needed, and bought up a year's stock. Now, it cost him a lot more than it would have cost him to get it from Japan. But he got it, he locked it away, and his business kept going when everybody else stopped. These are the type of risks that your business faces. And you have to try and look into the crystal ball and imagine what they could be and do whatever can be done to minimize the chance that they'll stop your business. Does that answer the question, Bob? Yes, that does. Thank you very much. And I, I, don't, I don't have any more questions. I don't see any that have come into the Q&A box. So um, if any of our listeners, which most are still on the line, thank you very much for staying on. Um, I'm going to start closing uh, here, but if something comes to mind, I'll be watching for the Q&A box and we could, um, we'll get that question before we actually hit the stop button. With that said, um, I want to thank all of the attendees for your uh, attendance and participation today. My hope is that you'll have several takeaways that will uh, help you see your company with proper perspective and use this planning procedure for making good business decisions. And Nick, thank you very much for contributing your time and expertise, expertise both for today and for the development of this webinar series. Um, I know it's late night for you in Australia, and we thank you for staying up. Uh, your presentation was really insightful, and we look forward to your March presentation. That's the next time you will be um, virtually on stage. And, uh, and then that will end the series in March. There are several to go between now and then, but uh, that will end the series. And then we look forward to your presentations at our conference at the end of April in San Diego. Uh, thank you again to Monica with Software Toolbox for um, her as usual, expertise in hosting, and thanks to John Weber, owner of Software Toolbox, for being our host and sponsor. Um, I want to ask all of the attendees to be sure to complete the survey that will come to you, and it literally takes seconds to complete, and it'll be in your inbox very soon, and that feedback is important to us. So in closing, here are just a, a couple of brief things I want to mention. Again, um, all webinars are archived. They're in, um, you can find them by going to Connected Community. The next webinar is November 20th. Registration and information will come out soon, and that's by Jeff Miller on the subject of project management. 
Um, second item is the JP Morgan CSIA industry survey recently concluded and that the results of that are in connected community um, under survey results. And watch for information on the ARC forum coming up in February. CSIA for the very first time has a panel presentation that includes end users of some of our integrators and it's a great opportunity for all of our members to I invite you to come, even though you won't be part of that presentation, but there's so much to learn as integrators from all the end users that attend the ARC forum in February. Um, the last item I want to say is that most connected community web pages now have Google Translator, and that is for the purpose of assisting our international members, remembering that we have members in 27 countries now. I see we do not have any additional questions that have come in, so I will simply say Thank you very much again for attending, and see you next month. Goodbye now. Thank you, Robert. Bye-bye. Goodbye, Nick. Goodbye, Monica. I'm going to stop the recording. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bob. You're still recording.